Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this next panel um, session, we're going to be focusing on mobile apps um, and talking particularly about the sort of challenge of bringing them successfully into the classroom. I think this is um, an area which I'm you know, very, very interested in because I think one of the most interesting things for someone like me who's done a lot of work internationally and then comes to work on um, the African continent, whether that's in South Africa or elsewhere, is the prevalence and speed of adoption of mobile technology here um, versus the adoption of other things like laptops um, and to a lesser extent tablets. So if you were to go into a school which was very tech focused in most other parts of the world, often laptops are the route which people take to being sort of a tech focused school. Now, as you've seen with other industries like fintech, the route which countries tend to take on the African continent is to go straight to the mobile phone. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to explore a little bit about how that's going to affect education. Um, sorry to anyone who was hoping to see Bilal Kathrada um, in this panel discussion. I am a very poor replacement. So sorry if you feel shortchanged, but hopefully you won't feel shortchanged by the other <coughs> panelists who are allowed to introduce themselves. Good day. Uh, Rian Graham, uh, Sales Director, Sub Saharan Africa for Ruckus Wireless. Okay, my, uh, my name is Lenai Nando. I'm a human rights lawyer by training, but I'm the co-founder of an organization called Amplify, and we work with um, delivering mobile learning technologies, um, especially in, um, sorry, the mic's not on, I hope you can hear it, but yeah, we work on providing. Okay, I'll just start afresh. My name is Danai Nando. I'm a human rights lawyer by training, um, but I'm also the co-founder of an organization called Amplified. And we're a learning and development consultancy, and we work on providing and delivering learning um, solutions, especially for schools in marginalized areas. Cool. Okay, fantastic. Um, guys, I mean, I think <coughs> where I'm sort of particularly interested in starting with this is actually um, to get a picture of where things are from your perspective, because I think that there is sometimes an idea that, like, you hear completely varying things from like everyone has a mobile phone to no one has one to they're being used loads in schools so they're not being really used. So I think it'd be interesting actually from all three of you to get a little bit of your perspective on sort of like where are we, at, are we with this right now and, and where might it go in the near future. So happy for anyone to start but let's hear from all three of you. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll take this one. Um, statistically in Africa currently the mobile adoption rate has just crossed over the 500 million mark. Yeah. Um, and there's a, a generalized view that that uh, momentum continues to grow at about 168 million uh, per year. So the adoption is immense. Yeah. Uh, reason for the adoption is varied. Uh, the cost of smartphones are decreasing rapidly, so it's becoming more um, accessible to, to lower income groups to get access to, to smartphones. And secondly, that ties into what you were stating quite clearly. In Africa, by default, because you've got access to a smartphone, you now have access to the internet, to knowledge, to information. And that becomes the medium of communication and learning as well. So what, what you've also seen in studies is that the mobile might be at home, but it isn't always allowed in schools. So it very much differs from school policy to school policy. And so sometimes schools might be in an affluent area, but the children are actually not allowed to bring their devices to school and are only allowed to use school devices. And so it varies. And that then impacts how the children actually work within that space and how they actually engage with that technology. The other side of it also is what kinds of apps and things are downloaded on the phones at home. And the other um, studies are showing that not always educational type apps are downloaded. So it depends on the knowledge of the parents or the knowledge of the user of what is being downloaded. So many social media apps are used, but not often educational apps. Or for example, a good one, when I was working with Google, I'd say, how many people have got a Gmail account? So if I had to say to you, how many people have got a Gmail account? And then I'd say to you, how many of you have clicked on the waffle? or have actually explored the other apps, almost no hands go up. 
And so people sometimes have apps or applications on their phones and they don't use them or realize the potential behind what's in that app. Yeah, thank you. I completely agree with you, Karen, there. And I think, for, I think for the African market specifically, what I find is we have almost tiers of access. So you have someone who has a smartphone, has access, but they also have the additional advantage of having connectivity. So they've got Wi-Fi or they've got uh, data on their phone. Then you have someone who, yes, has moved up the tier. Now they have access, but they actually have no data on the phone. So it is a smartphone, but it is doing nothing smart. Um, then you also have people who their access in terms of mobile is actually just a general feature phone that has no ability for um, connecting to the internet. So you almost have to find ways to tackle all three um, effectively. So I think whenever we're talking about you know, mobile learning and apps, especially on, in an African context, mm -hmm. um, you can't really give an overarching view because you have to tackle each of those tiers specifically because the solutions are very different. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the latest numbers I've seen on smartphone access is that in South Africa, it's about 40%. So even though that's still substantial, and it's probably one of the highest in the continent, yeah. th that means, assuming it's the same for learners, that 60% don't have access, right? So I think you're right, that feature phone market is really important. <laughs> one thing I wanted to ask you all about w was zero rating, um, because I think that's quite a big factor in some of this. So, if anyone, so zero rating is when mobile operators are able to make certain content, not use data or not cost you to go and access it. I just wanted to know, again, from, from any of you who ever wants to take this one up, um, what do you think we need to do to A, get more mobile operators to do that with more content, but B, to make sure it's effective? Because I think also sometimes people see it as like a magic bullet, and I'm not sure that necessarily it's so, maybe not if you want to start. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, talk, to actually talk about okay, it. Okay, good. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so I worked on an, um, a mobile learning platform in, um, in Zimbabwe called Rizio. And um, when we started working on it, essentially we wanted to provide um, students that um, had no access to mobile learning with mo a mobile learning solution. And like I said, then I was tackling the tier that probably had a smartphone or access to some sort of tablet but had no connectivity. So our biggest challenge was to try and get a mobile operator to buy into the idea that access to education for all is important and that it was important to zero rate. And thankfully, um, the largest uh, telecommunications network in Zimbabwe, Econet Wireless, bought into this very, in a very big way. And to be honest, scale would never have been achieved without the zero rating. Like, it would have been absolutely impossible. And just by virtue of doing that, I think um, you probably have to almost try and help the mobile operators to understand that beyond, I guess, the benefit of them giving access to students in getting education, there are additional benefits. Because you find um, a lot of, so for, for most of them, the way they're structured is maybe to get to the actual uh, learning solution, that point is zero rated and anything beyond that, then they get some sort of data usage. But beyond that, it's opening up the mindset of this potential market for the future. Because you've now given them, um, I guess, knowledge and an ability to know that this is what the internet can do, so they will essentially be the ones that will buy into that in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guys, any other thoughts? I think it's it, it, it should be it should be a de facto standard. To be fair, um, in 20 years from now, the young kids of today will be running the country, right? It'll be the doctors, the engineers, etc. We all understand the challenges we've got on this continent, specifically in the <coughs> rural areas. Now, why would an operator not want to participate? You are effectively enhancing their knowledge base, and they will be the guys, who knows, in 20 years' time, that runs the, the operator. You have to open it up. Mm. It needs to happen. The, the way I think about it, it's <coughs> anyone who's in banking will recognize this, that banks sort of compete with each other hand over fist to do student loan accounts. Right? Mm. Now, one thing that amazed me when I was a management consultant and I worked for a couple of banks is they make no money on those accounts. The reason they do it is just to acquire the customer. And actually, I, I think mobile operators could be missing a trick here. You know, and, and, and very quickly, if one does it, the others will have to do it. And, and I think it could really, could really transform things. I mean, certainly in Kenya, in NASA education, success has been, I think it's Safaricom, I think I'm right in saying that they partner with. It's been, as you say, they could never have got that scale without Safaricom. Sorry. So I think that it should be mandatory, I agree. In terms of, if you think the costs that we pay, um, if you look at fees must fall and helping students to get access, there are so many different ways, if it was Euro-rated, that students would be able to work more effectively within their own time 
and not necessarily have to incur things like transport costs to get to a library if they could access that online. And so it could have other ramifications that could benefit the community. And not only just the um, students, but if we think about um, apps and situations which benefit communities as a whole. For example, projects in India which used feature phones, but actually taught women how to read. Mm -hmm. So because of the space where women were taken out of school really, really early, there is a feature a phone course that actually teaches them to read and therefore empowers them. So just think about it from that point of view if it was zero rated. So one thing which I think we should address is the challenges of doing this. Now, I see two challenges. You guys might well see others. One challenge I see is, is teachers, um, with them being trained and developed to get it into the classroom in the right way. And, and as a teacher, for the second thing I'm about to say, I can see why you're nervous. The second thing is, I do think sometimes education technology, we're a little bit naive. Right? If you give a kid a mobile phone in class, my immediate inclination when I was 10 would not have been to go on to Khan Academy. If we'd had it in those days, it would have been to go onto Facebook or to play games or do whatever, right? So how do we get around those two challenges? How do we make sure teachers are comfortable and supported and trained? And secondly, how do we kind of make sure that brilliant like energy and inquiry that kids have is channeled towards maths, not, you know, whatever it might be? So I think from a teacher's point of view, if you, if you ban a phone and there's no school policy or the school policy is saying don't bring a phone, you can't have a discussion about a device that's not brought to school. So therefore, you can't actually have a meaningful values type discussion in terms of how to use it responsibly. Whereas if you're saying, bring the device to school, and you've got a good policy around it, and you can actually teach the children about their digital footprints, and the positive and the negative consequences of their footprints, and why that will have a long-term impact on them, I think that has much more benefit to the learner than saying, leave your phone at home. Then if you look at it from a teacher's point of view, you take away the fear. So you say to the teacher, yes, the device is managed within the school space. Yes, you're, the children have access to it, but the teacher actually knows how to use the device, has researched what apps and things that would benefit their lessons so they can guide the students for or through those types of lessons. So I definitely think there's space in which to both educate the teacher and take away the fear and say, hey, these mobile devices shouldn't be so scary and they can actually enhance it. And if you think about it, often schools say, we can't afford computers. Uh, we can't afford, afford a new lab. But if you ask the students to pull out their phones in their pockets, they're actually walking around with really, really good technology that could be used there. Mm. So it could actually help the schools with, in terms of their um, costs and saving costs around that space as well. Yeah, if I can add, I think, I think technologically there are means and ways of making sure that whatever device gets brought into the environment of the school gets controlled and managed. So in other words, only certain apps will be allowed while you're in a, in a fenced area, right? So there's technologies that do this. Um, I think the, the much larger challenge we are sitting with today um, is that the, the teachers in the classrooms, they were never skilled and taught yeah. how to use technology in the classroom. You said that in the past tense. Are they being today? Well, that's the question. So I, <laughs> I, mean, I actually want to take it back to when they enter college, teacher's college or yeah. university, what is the curriculum doing to address the needs of the kids in the classrooms today? And that's the big question. How do we expect our kids to live in a 21st world century with technology, embracing technology the way they are, if the teachers that are supposed to guide them don't, aren't given the skill to do this? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a major disconnect, and you will find it, it's, it's, it's nature. If I get introduced to something new that I'm familiar with or uncomfortable with, what's yeah. the first reaction? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, okay. So we have to bridge that. Yeah, I think I, I agree fully with you there. I think in most, um, especially with the teaching profession, most African countries that I've encountered, I've seen just the irony behind um, teachers are expected to be forward thinking, and yet for most of them, if they got a teaching profession in 19, 
78, that was about it. Um, <laughs> and there is no, like for most professions, there's an ongoing professional development. Yeah. For the teaching profession, it's not like that. And for some reason, we expect uh, to arrive within a school with an exciting technology, get these teachers to understand it through like a two hour workshop, and then yeah. suddenly they can train students how to do it. And I think we're doing a lot of disservice to teachers because we're essentially um, expecting them to get a skill that one cannot get that easily. Yeah. And most times there's a joy and excitement that comes with a new technology coming into school, but as soon as you leave, that's about it with your technology and no one actually uses it. So I find that the issue is never really that the technologies are not good. I think we have amazing ed tech solutions. But the process and the implementation, the approach to how we bring them within the schools, I think is still very flawed. Yeah. And we need to understand what educators need, so we provide that for them. I think to add to that, how do you do this at scale? In Gauteng alone, there's two and a half thousand plus minus schools. It's about 70,000 teachers. How do you skill them in a manner that supports what we are trying to achieve? Yeah. It's and tough is that where technology can really help us? Yeah. Because if we started using collaborative technologies, encourage teachers to share, encourage teachers to express their views of within a space, that you actually learn from each other. So if you've ever been in a school staff room and somebody's had a really exciting lesson and they start telling each other about it, you start learning from each other. And so if you take that kind of idea and scale it, encourage teachers to share, and I think that's what we're seeing more and more with the technologies and the teaching spaces and the communities of practice that are hopping up around technology and education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that the potential for a... Is, lady wants to ask a question. And please, by the way, anyone, we, we've, we've been talking a lot up front. Please just stick hands up and I'll pick people. Um, yes. I think there's also quite an interesting um, dynamic that we're not talking about, and that's the elephant in the room <laughs> around education <laughs> policy, um, government, yeah. legislation, the whole NQF, um, the very um, structured and overburdened administrative system. We're kind of nailing teachers for not being tech savvy, but they don't even have the time to be able to get through all the administrative requirements that they have to meet in terms of the system, which is completely overburdened and completely skewed in the form of an old and archaic system. So, you know, how do we then assist teachers in being able to, um, without nailing them to the wall, I mean, how do we help them to become more effective in the 21st century? Because it's not only around the learning model, it's not only around the technology, it's also around how they cope with everything that they've got on their plate. Marking, extracurricular activities, and all of those elements as well. So it's a lot more complex than just oh. how do we apply technology to a classroom. I think that's a good question. I think actually, things, one of the things I think we don't talk about enough in ed tech is how do we reduce the burden on teachers using technology? Mm -hmm. Right. So, guys, thoughts on that? How can we use mobile phones, or how have you seen people use mobile phones to make teachers' lives easier and to make you know learning easier and that kind of thing? So, the, there are a couple of ideas around that. Um, if you're in a collaborative document with teachers and you have to do lesson planning, it cuts down on your time when you can share it. If you're using a real-time collaborative document, say for example for staff meetings those notes are recorded while the meeting is happening. Other people can actually be seeing what's been typed, can actually cop comment on it or edit it, and by the time the meeting's finished, nobody has to go back somewhere else, type up the minutes, and you get it a week later. At the end of that meeting, it's done and dusted. You can, into your calendar, you can add um, a collaborative meeting space. So perhaps parents don't necessarily have to come to school. They can hop into a meeting, um, so I'm going to use a Google term, Hangout, um, like a Skype, and you can be in that meeting at the same time. So you can be saving traveling time, and you can use those same type of tools for across school training. And so there are so many different types of technologies which assist from that point of view. Um, I've seen schools in rural areas where teachers are using collaborative documents on their phones and actually building the 
technology around, I mean, building the lessons around that without having to move from space to space. So the only technology they had was their phone. And they were able to work collaboratively and save time from a prep point of view, from a sharing resources point of view, and a learning from each other point of view. We just got the signal from the back. We've only got five minutes. So what I'm going to start doing is taking two or three questions and then letting you kind of respond to them all. So those are, I think someone previously had a question at the back. So we've got lady with... I can't quite see what you're wearing, so I can't describe you, but I think it's a grey sweater. It's very fetching, whatever it is. Um, and then there's a gentleman in front of you who's got a question, and then a gentleman here. So if all three of you could ask a question, and then I'll put all three of them to the panel. Yes, the lady in the fetching sweater first. Thank you. Madalena Clear from Mind Unique Education. I um, have been involved with um, rollout of technology at UJ, at RAW, at CTI Education and Pearson Institute, where we've done the tablet rollout to campuses nationally, doing the student and lecturer training and the infrastructure and all those realities of rolling out technology to students who were supposed to manage technology in a very responsible way. The reality, unfortunately, is to a large extent, while I was doing the interviews with students and lecturers, that there are so many challenges around that, that students are using it for many, many, many other things, except for the purpose while, <laughs> why they received it. And so much so that some lecturers had to stop the students bringing their tablets to a classroom because it's so interrupted. So, although we are envisaging all these wonderful realities that can work, in many cases the realities, unfortunately, will play out in another way. And that is young students who are supposed to be almost adults. We know how we are struggling to be role models and not being enslaved by the technology. How can we expect from growing children whose brains haven't been developed to the maturity levels that adults have, to really manage and know what's good for them and what's not, and how they can download apps and what will be okay for them. Because, unfortunately, I have to say that we'll have to come back to the basics and be critical about what we are doing yeah. to our children and ourselves, not to lose our humanity. Cool. We'll have to put the human back, the brain and the body and the spirit back into what we are doing and realizing just to go and run with the flow and what everybody thinks is right is not necessarily the best cool. that thank, we thank, need thank to go. Thank you very much. And there's two gentlemen who had questions here at the front as well. Thank you very much. Um, we're talking about social media platforms and yeah. the ideology behind that is to create engagement. Now, Klopfer did interesting research in 2013, from 11 to 13, on the matter of what do people do with the access to, to mobile devices. Yeah. It was interesting to know that 60% of kids, so they did two groups, people who are in traditional schools with a strong pedagogy, where I'm the teacher and I'm text-bound, I'm still in the print age, and people who are more andragogical, who says, well, the print may be there and we will respect it, but we go, we respect the notion of the internet of things and we look at it more as an open space. The kids who were in the open school systems, 60% of them used their time on their mobiles to search education matters. The kids who were not in the open school systems didn't use 9% of the time on educational websites. Okay, thank you. And then the gentleman we got, is that, is that the gentleman behind yeah. you who also wants to ask a question? We, sorry, go on, <coughs> straight up, yeah. Al Alvain Toffler in his book, Future Shock, said that the rate of change will never again be as slow as it is today. Yeah. That was 17 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And Rian, you, 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 you came with a question about access. It's interesting that if you drive into Chwani today you, on the internet, 
the other day they switched on Diepslut, 850,000 people instantly had access to the internet. And our LMS that we have with Agricologists International has a game-changing app, and that is that the student is able to go to a hotspot, yeah. download the coursework, and go back into the rural environment and yeah. study his coursework. That's a game-changer. So the access to technology is very much something that's growing with this ideology of blending and sharing technology with standard formal educational systems. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, if you could all give a relatively brief, sorry, response to either any of those three questions, all of those three questions as you choose. Okay. Firstly, the lady, the first question. Yeah. Um, I think we as, we as adults and parents should be very aware that as adults and as parents with kids, we need to understand what social media apps are available, what the kids use. For instance, are you aware that Facebook's got an age restriction? Are you aware that WhatsApp has got an age restriction under the terms and conditions? Please do yourselves a favor and go and have a look at that. If you are not aware, you are potentially giving, it, it's like, sorry, it's like when you smoke, you're not allowed to have cigarettes until you're 18. That's law. Yet, we give our kids a cell phone, enjoy WhatsApp. There's, there's restrictions. So we need to, as parents, take ownership. And it can't just be free reign, right? Um, because we are the parents, we should take ownership of the well-being of our kids. We should at least know and investigate what social media platforms they use. Mm -hmm. um, and then, sorry, just to comment on the, on the, um, the Wi-Fi project in Pretoria. Um, that is an, an ideal example of where... Um, kids or students can access um, a free service to get access to their content for you know, either university or school and then take it back to the rural area, mm. uh, be it on a mobile device or on a tablet, whatever, to yeah. continue. And I think those initiatives should, should continue. And I think the organization behind that is an organization called Project, it's the Project to Betzer, I think, Project in Swanee, and it's Project, it's Project, it's Project to Seize Way, Correct. I think, in other parts of the country. It might be the other way around. But anyway, it's Seize Way also Betzer, they go under both names. They're amazing. If anyone else wants to do something similar to what Sean and I have done, go talk to them or come and talk to me about them. Anyway. And myself, so yeah, we're directly sure. involved. Oh, so. wonderful. Okay, well, then that's brilliant. Guys, other people on to the forward. I was just thinking to sum up, to say that it's to teach the people who've got the devices to know what you don't know. So teaching them to explore and see what is most relevant. So from a parent's point of view or from a teacher's point of view, what would suit or what knowledge base or what app would suit you for what you're trying to teach or achieve at that particular time? Yeah, I think also to sum up, I think, I guess I come from, from the field where I am, you know, highly advocating for quality education for all and fully acknowledging, you know, the, main, the disadvantages that do come up with technology access, but also amplifying the fact that um, access to technology will allow us to do so much more than we could ever do if our goal is to build more schools. Um, if we just look at you know, the African uh, youth population, we'll never be able to get each and every person into a brick and mortar university. But the potential we have right now in terms of online education, in terms of MOOCs, is so vast. So I guess I'm at a place where I'm saying I choose to believe that technology can achieve so much more positive than the negative. And if we are able to, um, to get that message out so much stronger, um, we'll, we'll achieve more in the continent. Yeah. Cool, thanks guys. I think to try and sum up the opinions of people who are better informed and cleverer than me is always difficult. Um, but to, I think what we heard really was that we need to be sort of quite clear and directive about what people are able to do on mobiles to realize their potential. I think we heard a big appeal for telecom companies to do a lot more to support this sector. <laughs> Um, and I think we heard also a big shout for the impact this can have in rural areas, particularly maybe people using Wi-Fi in other areas and bringing content back. So I'd like everyone to give a big round of applause to our panelists. And anyone who wants to talk about this further, I'm sure they'd be delighted to chat to you. Thank you.